like to thank you all for being here, and I'd like to thank Ambassador Ahn and Dr. Lee for two excellent presentations, which have given us a lot to think about this afternoon. Um, and I'd also like to thank our two questioners who I think have helped sort of set the stage for some of the areas where I want to go to as well in our discussion this afternoon. Um, first off, I don't know that I could perhaps uh, introduce you all any better than Ambassador Ahn did earlier. <laughs> um, so I will try to be brief um, and just um, sort of, you have their bio so you can get more detail there. Um, but to my immediate left uh, is Derek Scissors, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he studies Asian economic issues and trends. Um, in particular, he focuses on the Chinese and the Indian economies and US economic relations with China and India. Before joining AEI, he was a senior uh, research fellow in the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, next to Derek, we have Maria Solis, who is a senior fellow and the Philip Knight Chair in Japan Studies at the Brookings Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Uh, Dr. Solis is an expert in Japan's foreign economic policies and analyzes, and her analysis includes uh, consideration of whether free trade agreements can be an effective tool to implement the domestic structural reforms needed to enhance the competitiveness of the Japanese economy, which is something I think Dr. Lee was briefly talking about in terms of needing to improve efficiency and using trade as one way to potentially do that. Um, next to uh, Dr. Solis, we have uh, James Fothery, who is the Executive Vice President of the U.S.-Korea Business Council, President of the U.S.-Japan Business Council, and Senior Director for Japan and Korea at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, in his role as a Senior Director, uh, he helps set the Chamber's priorities and policy positions for Korea and Japan as part of the Asia Division's overall agenda and programs. And next to uh, James, we have Edward Alden, who is the Bernard L. Schwartz Senior Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, where he specializes in U.S. economic competitiveness, U.S. trade, and international economic policy. Previously, he was the Canadian Bureau Chief for the Financial Times and was also the managing editor of the newsletter Inside U.S. Trade, which is based here in Washington, D.C. Well, I guess where I'd like to start off, we, we've heard a good deal of discussion about the course FTA this afternoon, and I want to you know, move from the course FTA to much of the discussion we have here in DC on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then also touch on one of the other significant agreements uh, in Asia, which is the Korea-China FTA, and sort of where that is and what it means for perhaps trends in the region. Uh, but first, you know, starting with Chorus, we've heard you know, Ambassador On give a strong push for the Chorus FTA. Um, you know, Dr. Lee has talked about it as well. Um, but you know, the Chorus FTA is something that the Obama administration has, you know, indicated is, you know, sort of the baseline for the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations. And, you know, if any of you perhaps remember the time when Korea concluded its FTA with the United States, the Chinese immediately said that they would like an FTA with Korea as well. So it sort of spurred those talks along. So the challenge, though, is, as we all know, uh, many critics in Washington have said the Chorus FTA has not necessarily been successful. So, Maria, I guess just to start off, we're three years into the agreement. You know, is it too early to reach a conclusion, as Dr. Lee said, or how would you evaluate the agreement at this point? Uh, thank you, Troy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, certainly, it is too early to have a full assessment of, you know, what are the, going to be the outcomes and consequences. Uh, and I leave, you know, the discussion of implementation issues and the discussion on the performance of export and imports to some of my colleagues. But I think we can make some statements regarding the implications of the Corus FTA uh, regarding how it has actually helped propel the trade strategy of each country, both the United States and South Korea. And I think in that front, a macro level answer, if you will, I feel more confident in saying that overall it has actually been a very successful trade agreement that has helped move forward in very significant ways the trade strategy of South Korea and of the United States. So let me elaborate a little bit on those points. First of all, very much in agreement with what, what Mr. Lee was saying, I think that the Chorus FTA really marks the turning point in Korea trade negotiations, free trade negotiations. I think it's a before and after. I look at the evolution of Korea trade policy and it was a much more defensive approach where you had many sensitive sectors set aside, where Korea's uh, early uh, partners in these trade negotiations actually represented a small uh, portion of its overall uh, trade. But with the Chorus FTA, you have South Korea for the first time ever actually narrowing down in a significant way 
the range of sensitive issues that is going to set aside that cannot be touched by tariff elimination. You also have, as Mr. Lee was saying, South Korea really taking on board this rules issue, going for a deep integration agenda that really marks the 21st wave of uh, trade agreements. So I think of the Corus FTA from a point of view of South Korea as a stepping stone that has allowed South Korea actually to now negotiate with main training, uh, uh, negotiating partners, trading partners like the European Union as well. And I think it has left South Korea in a very good position when it's considering now potential TPP membership. The price of admission into the TPP should not be very steep for uh, South Korea because it already has gone through that kind of adjustment. It already has negotiated very ambitiously with the United States. We know that the TPP is not a replica of the Korea-US uh, free trade agreement. There are many other issues that have been incorporated since. But I think in the most important message out there is that South Korea can muster their resolve, their ambition to actually undertake an agreement as ambitious as the TPP. So that actually gets South Korea along a, a lot of the way into the TPP. Now, let me just very briefly, uh, regarding how the Corus FTA has helped the United States, I think it's very clear that it has been a tremendous push for U.S. trade strategy in Asia Pacific. The United States has long proclaimed that it's a Pacific power with very significant economic and security stakes in Asia. And the United States cannot remain disconnected from the most vibrant region in the world, and that is Asia. And we know that in order for the United States to engage with this region, trade diplomacy is a main component. But I would argue that it has been challenging for the United States at some points in time to actually be a major player in the process of Asia-Pacific regional integration. Let me give you some examples as to how it was a challenging proposition in the past. Probably not many of you remember, because I see relatively young faces here, but there was a time when, for example, the United States and many Asian countries did not agree in APEC where the process of liberalization should be binding or not, for example. We also know that when the United States tried to negotiate bilaterally with some developing countries in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Malaysia, those negotiations came to nothing. And very importantly, when the United States and South Korea began to negotiate the course FTA, the, blue, uh, the broader blueprints for integration in the region did not include the United States. We're talking about ASEAN plus three, we're talking about ASEAN plus six. So in my mind, two main trade initiatives helped the United States gain traction in its trade diplomacy in the region, whereby the so-called FTA, free trade agreement template of the United States acquired resonance. One is the Corus free trade agreement. It had a very important demonstration effect that the United States could negotiate successfully with a large Asian economy. And then a few years later, uh, the United States actually seeking accession into what was a tiny, very obscure trade agreement, the P4, that eventually became the TPP. So I think when you look at the importance of the Corus FTA for both countries, it's clear that it has helped these countries sustain momentum in developing a far more ambitious trade strategy. Now, Ted, I mean, clearly Morea is saying that the Corus FTA has been important to both the United States and Korea. But as we listen to, you know, and part of this is because we have the debate over TPA going on now, you know, the criticism has been that basically the deficit has grown and so therefore course has not worked. You know, is that the case or have there been other factors that have inhibited U.S. exports? Well, I, I, I want to pick up on Maria's very interesting point that for Korea, the course FTA was a, a real break. There's a before and after. If you look at the U.S. trade debate, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's a before and after NAFTA. <laughs> Everything has, has been about, sorry, am I not on here? No, I think your mic is actually behind your time. A little, little too low. Uh, let's put it on. Is that, uh, is that better? Yeah. There's, for the United States, it's really a before and after NAFTA. And, and so much of the U.S. debate is about trying to assess and digest the trade impacts of NAFTA and the subsequent agreements. And I, and I would include, most importantly, China's entry to the WTO. So I think, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the question of the impact of the course FTA is looked at very much with respect to that history of agreements. And if you look in, in each case, there were a set of promises made to the American people about what would happen in terms of the trade deficit that didn't play out quite the way the administration's promised. Am I still yeah, not yeah, coming it's through not here? On, yeah. Sorry. Is the green light on on top? Green Press the center on. button. How about that? Is that better? Is it on now? Come on now. 
Uh, no, this one. I don't know. My green light's on. I've tried it both different directions. No, nope, still not working. Sorry about that. This one must be out of juice. Um, so again, as I was saying, for, for the United States, everything's very much a before and after NAFTA. And it's about trying to assess the impact of those agreements on the U.S. economy. And in, and in each of those cases, what we saw fairly rapidly after the agreements was an increase in the U.S. trade deficit. I mean, administrations before NAFTA, before China's entry to the WTO, made a standard argument, which is those countries have higher trade barriers than we do, and therefore, in the aftermath of these agreements, we should expect U.S. exports to increase very rapidly, imports to increase more slowly, and the trade deficit to shrink. And of course, that did not prove to be the case in the short term. Now, part of the problem is it's very difficult to assess these agreements in the short term. I mean, Korea, three years does not begin to be an adequate period of time to do that because there are all sorts of other forces that affect whether the trade deficit grows or shrinks. And I want to be clear, a growing trade deficit is not definitely, you know, obviously a problem. Uh, the periods of strongest U.S. trade growth, for instance, in the 1990s, are the ones where our trade deficit grew uh, the most significantly. If you look over time, the tendency has been for a shrinking trade deficit. With NAFTA, for instance, if you look at goods trade in the entire NAFTA region, there's actually a slight surplus now if you include Canada and Mexico. I think if you look over time, we're likely to begin to see the same trends taking place with China. If you look at the Korea-EU FTA, there was great imbalance in auto trade between the two, which is something you hear a lot about in the U.S. debate. Most recently, we've seen European exports increase to Korea quite dramatically, so you actually have a, a slight European surplus in auto trade. So I think one of the important things with all these agreements is you can't rush to quick judgments. But from the U.S. perspective, particularly we're in the, when we're in the middle of a congressional debate over trade promotion authority, there is an effort to try to reach these very quick conclusions based on what the most recent agreement was. And in this case, that was, of course, FTA. So I think Korea's really found itself in the gun sites with respect to the, the U.S. congressional debate. Now, Jim, you work with the U.S. business community on a daily basis. From the perspective of U.S. business, how has the agreement performed? Um, first of all, let me ch check my mic. Is it working? Okay. Um, I would underscore a couple of things that other people have alluded to. First, the chorus agreement in principle and practice is the strongest, best agreement that we've yet negotiated to date. It is the, the platform for much of what's being negotiated in the TPP. So I think from that perspective, the U.S. business community has welcomed it, not only for its commitment to eliminate tariffs, but more importantly, to start to get at these beyond the border non-tariff measures, regulation standards, and things that have been particularly troublesome in Korea, but in, in other economies as well. So I think that fundamentally is a very important point to underscore. Korea is a big trading partner of the, U of the U.S., and it is a bigger trading partner now as a result of course. We've seen, as other people have mentioned, increases in our exports of manufactured goods, in our exports of services, in our exports of agricultural goods. And you can look at specific line items where tariffs have been cut, exports have gone up. I mean, there's a direct correlation. I think the main problem that we see at this stage of the game is, is something that Dr. Lee and others have alluded to, which is that in its complexity in getting to the new kinds of rules areas, it takes time for these things to be addressed and worked through. And so it's relatively easy for people to say, okay, well, we've got to reduce a tariff from X to X over this period of time. And we haven't even yet eliminated all the tariffs, or we haven't even implemented all the tariff commitments under Coruscant. yet. We're at about 80%, I think, and we're, we're due to move to 95% tariff elimination over the next couple of years. So we're still making progress there. But these other things, where it requires new rules for things like cross-border data movement, where it requires new rules for transparency in areas like medical devices or new or patent linkage in the pharmaceutical area. Those are very technical, complex issues. Korea has got some room to go in terms of adopting best global practices. And that's, I think, something that I, I really noted that Dr. Lee said. This is an important thing for Korea because it will, it will fully modernize and integrate its economy into the global system. So it's, it's important to do that, and it's important to do it sooner rather than later. And I think that ultimately is in Korea's best interest. So that's where we've seen the kind of challenges under chorus. I would also echo what, what Ted said. 
you can't look at a single figure, trade deficit, and conclude that it's a failure. That's not, that's just way too simplistic. And so we, we say that it is a um, strong trade agreement. It establishes the platform to build an even bigger and, and more comprehensive economic relationship between the U.S. and Korea. But we need to work collectively through the chorus mechanisms. There's an elaborate committee structure, which is another new feature of chorus, which is actually quite significant to allow ongoing consultations to resolve issues before they have to be taken to the dispute settlement procedures that are set up in the chorus agreement. Now, I'd just like to do one follow-up question, which you sort of alluded to, which is, you know, you've talked about regulatory changes and the need for that, but one of the things that we haven't talked about much, Dr. Lee brought up in his presentation, but is the services component. I mean, when we hear a lot of the criticisms, you know, you don't tend to hear much of it you know, about bringing the services side into it. So how does the services picture look? Well, in a word, it looks better um, because there were commitment made, commitments made to, to change things in some fields like audiovisual, um, digital trade, financial services, insurance, et cetera. So I think on the face of it, things are significantly better. Someone, uh, Dr. Lee and others, have alluded to the changes in the legal market. Uh, accounting is opening up and that sort of thing. So there are clearly new opportunities being created in Korea in the services area. Very important for U.S. companies because we are highly competitive globally in these services areas and it does represent big opportunities for us. Services though often evolve or revolve around technical nitty-gritty details and you got to get the details right and you got to you got to meet the commitments fully and faithfully in order to to get these things done right. We've had some, I should say, difficulties in the cross-border data rules, for example, and that's taken some time for Korean officials to get comfortable with the idea that data moves across borders, it can be moved, it can be processed. It does not have to reside in Korea in domestically located servers in order to become more secure. That's a fallacy. So we've had to work through those kinds of things. Derek, I would I don't want to belabor the point of the deficit and everything, <laughs> but you know, there's data to suggest though that, you know, if you look at chorus, you know, Jim talked about, you know, that we're only maybe about eighty percent, you know, tariff at this point. That if you look at the beneficiary items, there has been growth and I think um Ambassador Ahn referenced actually that in his talk, um, and that a lot of the deficit has come from the non beneficiary sides. But let's for the sake of argument maybe even say that, you know, that the critics you know, arguments are correct. You know, are imports from Korea bad for the U.S. economy? Uh, I, I think you know my answer to that is no. Um, I think, uh, you know, there are two elements of the debate in Washington, and I'm getting all these email messages from the Senate. Apparently, the Republicans are fighting with each other now about amendments to TPA. Um, just, you know, in case you wanted to know. Um, there are two elements of the debate in Washington, and one of it is imports are bad. And this is a group of people in Washington and around the country who don't like competition. And, and I would actually change Dr. Lee's point a little bit and say, I don't want more efficient regulations. I want more competition in the market. That will drive outcome efficiency. That's really what drives economic prosperity. So when people say, I don't like competition, and I'm not, this is, I'm not giving a percentage, and I'm not saying everybody who opposes TPP, even though we haven't seen it, or opposes TPA is in this group. There is a group in this country. There's a group in Korea I'm aware of. There's certainly a group in China that just don't like competition. And they want to sacrifice national prosperity for their own gain. And then they make arguments about how my sector is more important. And everyone else should face competition, but not me. So there's that group. And that, that is a politically powerful, completely economically illegitimate argument. Um, there's really nobody who supports that except people who are being paid directly by those groups. Now, there's another group. And this is the group that swings the vote, that, that swing, they'll swing the vote on TPA, swing the vote on TPP if we can get it finished, and so on, swung the vote on course. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't oppose the trade deficit, it doesn't oppose imports. People who just cite those, they're, 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 they're literally against national prosperity for their own purposes. But there are groups that have specific concerns. The one you hear about a lot in TPP, and I won't get off topic, but is ISDS. That's not about the trade deficit. It's a, it's a different kind of concern that we, we have to see the terms to see if that's legitimate. Trade enforcement, which is an element of discussion in the course that bears directly on TPP. 
If there's a provision in the course that I hate and wish wasn't there, it doesn't matter. It still has to be followed by the partners. You're undermining the support for trade in the country. So that's a real issue. So I would say they're two different things. They're the people who grab onto the trade deficit and say imports are bad for the country, you, you, you just kind of have to ignore that. There are people who talk about trade issues which could include imports and affect import volumes that really do matter. And those have to be addressed. And, and course has to prove to be a good treaty in those regards. And so does TPP. Well, since Republicans are apparently fighting with each other, why don't we go ahead and move to the TPA debate briefly? Um, you know, Ted, last week the Senate, um, you know, struck a deal to move TPA through the Senate. Um, you know, but the House ultimately could be the sticking point, though perhaps Derek might have a little bit more insight on this. And, but let's start with you, and then maybe Derek can fill in on what you see as the challenges for TPA going forward. Um, well, I, I would agree. I, I think passage is certainly easier in the Senate. I, I, I will say I was surprised by how my old media colleagues uh, treated the, the first vote on cloture, that somehow this was a disaster for the president. I mean, it was a symbolic mm -hmm. vote. They, you know, the, the Democrats, Senator Wyden and others, had some points they wanted to make to the president, and, and, and the vote went through, I think, as most of us had anticipated. I, I do think there are some difficult amendments. I think, you know, there was a discussion in Dr. Lee's presentation about currency issues. I think the, the amendment from Senator Portman arguing that... Uh, that the issue of currency manipulation ought to be one negotiated on in the TPP is, a, is going to be a very difficult amendment. The, the administration is strongly opposed to that, and, and I think it stands a, a reasonable chance of passage in the Senate. House, probably not, but I, I think that will be a, a difficult issue to work out. Um, in terms of the overall TPA vote, I, I, I do think it will pass the Senate relatively easily. House is, house is harder. I mean, the, they're going to need some Democratic votes. Um, there are a lot of Republicans who will support it. But there is some, and Derek probably has a better sense uh, than I do of the size of this, there's some group of Republicans who won't support it simply because they don't want to give President Obama this sort of authority. Interestingly, that's a change from when I, I used to come. I mean, the last TPA vote, you have to go all the way back to 2002. At that time, there actually was a significant rump of Republicans who were worried about specific industries, particularly the textile and apparel industry in the Carolinas. Um, there aren't many of those anymore. There isn't, uh, you know, even... Uh, Roger Milliken's company, the, the late Roger Milliken, a wonderful article in the Wall Street Journal about how Milliken is now in favor of the TPP. That, they used to be the biggest funders of, of the uh, anti-fast track uh, forces. So I think that group is fairly small, but there will be some Republicans who will not vote for it. And the question is how many Democrats you need to offset that. And the White House doesn't have very many. Um, the number now is probably in the neighborhood of 20. And there's some people saying they may need to get to 30. So I don't know, you, you get into nose counting pretty quickly here. Anything you'd like to add, Derek, on the TPA debate? Um, you know, there are two threats. One is a, a, some, something that the he Senate sends over that the House can't swallow. Um, that's what the argument is about now, um, what the House will buy. It's what senators arguing about what the House will buy. I mean, if you could ask the House, and they would tell you. Um, so uh, that's one possibility. I don't think it'll go that far. Uh, I do think that there's a possibility of uh, needing a conference which would delay TPA, which would delay the best offers from the TBP partners, which puts us in danger of you know, being subject to the political calendar and who announces on the Republican side and if Senator Clinton ever takes a stand or Secretary Clinton, I'm Secretary Clinton, I guess, over Senator ever takes a stand on this, that throw, throws another wrench. The big issue, though, is not any of those. If, if I could control one thing, I would say TPA is going to pass and it'll pass fairly soon, uh, which is the congressional Republicans of the White House have to not fight about an, a non-trade issue. They can fight about trade and congressional Democrats can be as loud as they want. The key is the relationship between congressional Republicans and the White House. And that, if that gets messed up by something that doesn't have to do with trade, then the sort of whatever three to one odds that TPA will pass fairly soon drop way down. So Maria, if Derek is right, you know, and TPA is going to pass. That means at some point we'll move towards actually finishing up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, hopefully. But, you know, right now Korea is not a member. They've, you know, expressed interest. But what would be, you know, from the Korean perspective, perhaps, their motivation for joining? And what are the costs, potentially, of staying out? Thank you, Troy. Well, I think that there are a number of factors that weigh heavily in the minds of uh, South Korean policymakers and that encourage them to seek uh, TPP partnership uh, entry. I think it has taken too long, actually, and hopefully progress would have taken place sooner. But I think it's easy to understand the rationale for wanting in. One is that, you know, there are estimates about trade and investment diversion. It's not a 
major trade investment diversion, but it is significant. And it has to do mostly with the fact that you have Japan in the TPP. Japan is a very important partner uh, for South Korean economic terms, and therefore not having access in the best preferential terms to the Japanese market does bite to some extent uh, a, Japan, uh, a Korean uh, company. So obviously avoiding that uh, exclusion is important. I think that membership in the TPP would also give South Korea the opportunity to update uh, some of the trade agreements it has already established with some TPP countries because these were earlier generation trade agreements, as I alluded before. They were not as ambitious. They did not offer the best terms of access. So uh, it would be very important, therefore, to modernize these trade agreements. And I think that the big prize for South Korea, as I, me as I mentioned before, is preferential market access vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Japan. And I think that would uh, mark a very important uh, gain. <coughs> These are very concrete uh, um, benefits. I think they're more diffuse uh, uh, benefits as well. One is membership uh, uh, benefits, if you will. You think about the TPP as a pioneer trade agreement. Certainly, if and when it happens, if, uh, uh, if it did, does come into fruition, it's going to be the most ambitious trade agreement covering Asia. And I think that for a country like South Korea that is trade dependent, that has made the, its emergence as a trade hub a central priority, in its uh, policy to be on the uh, sidelines of these mega trade agreement is costly. And there are the foreign policy considerations. To the extent that the TPP is a central element of the rebalancing strategy, then it makes all the sense for South Korea to be part of this group, as it is a very important uh, uh, ally of the United <coughs> States. So I think it's a combination of very concrete uh, 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 economic benefits, but larger foreign policy um, benefits as well. So, Jim, what would it mean from a business perspective if Korea were to join? Well, I, I think I would echo a lot of what Maria has just said. I think from the business community's perspective, first of all, there would be an important signaling effect. You've got these competing architectures, RCEP, and, and Korea's got its agreement with China, et cetera, that are going on. I think if Korea fully committed to joining the TPP, and, and we can talk about the timing and the dynamics of that. I think clearly we're at the end game here in the first tranche, so second tranche. Uh, but I think it's an important signaling effect for them to say, yes, we're ready to commit to the highest possible standards that are in existence in, in plurilateral trade agreements. And so I think that would uh, resonate with people. And then I think it's an opportunity for them to take the time to get the chorus details right, which I alluded to earlier, these technical issues getting the transparency, getting their business practices and, and, and regulatory practices in line with things that are going to be expected in the TPP because there are some higher standards in some areas in the TPP than there are in Korea because we've just evolved, as I, as I indicated earlier, we just evolved this agreement a bit more from where the course is. So I think it is a good opportunity to continue to move Korea in the right direction towards market openness, transparency, um, and et cetera, and all of that is, is in their long-term economic interest, as, as well as the interest of U.S. companies that are exporting to or doing business in Korea. Well, I am interested in this question of, you know, should Korea, you know, come full forward and want to join, you know, what is the optimal time? You know, we have a series of restrictions in terms of notification of negotiations and other things. So, I mean, Ted, you know, is there perhaps a better time for Korea to really push forward? I mean, I agree with Jim. I think it's very clear. Korea, though, it, it has indicated that it would like to. I think Korea is not going to be part of this first tranche. I think the United States very much at this point does not want to complicate the negotiations. It doesn't want to, to make the domestic political situation more complicated than it already is. Um, as I said, the currency issue is very hard. And in the last Treasury report, it, it singled out Korea for, for interventions in, in the foreign exchange market. And, I, and I'll leave open the legitimacy of, of, of Treasury's critique. But adding Korea right at this point with the negotiations active, I think, is, is, is too complex. I don't think that's going to happen. So the question is then, when's the next opportunity? And I think Korea is very much first in line there. I, I do think that there will be a significant opportunity before the end of the Obama administration. So let's imagine that TPP gets it concluded this year. There may be some window in 2016. And, and, I, and I think it behooves the Obama administration to move quickly to send out a clear message to other countries in the region that this is indeed an open agreement. Because that's been the rhetoric, that's what they've said. 
but it will be important to show that in, in practice. And this, this will be a new departure for the United States. I mean, NAFTA really never had any docking provisions. And after NAFTA was negotiated, the Clinton administration talked about creating a free trade area of the Americas that would be some kind of expansion of NAFTA to the region. But for a variety of reasons, that never happened. So, so I don't think we actually have an example of a big regional agreement that is a living agreement in the way the administration has envisioned this one. So I, I do think it would be very much in the US interest and in Korea's interest to move as quickly as possible after TPP has been uh, concluded to, to take that, that next step. I'd like to hope it can be done before the end of this administration. That may be optimistic. But. I just want to add a little bit to that because I, it's hard for me to imagine it happening next year. But I do think, I, I totally agree with Ted that, that it's in Korea's interest to move quickly. And what I mean by that is if Korea gets put into a second round with a bunch of countries that haven't made the changes and are going to be much more resistant to some of them, uh, including some competitors of Korea, I won't name them, but one begins with T. Um, uh, you know, much less other countries that have farther to go that, that, you know, praise to them, want to aspire to a very high standard agreement, but it's going to be much harder for them to, to conduct these negotiations than Korea. Korea, if Korea is not, doesn't try to get itself uh, in with the right group or maybe a group of one, just Korea, there could be a significant delay. And you know, we don't have the TPP terms, so I'm not sitting here trying to sort of wave the flag like this is a disaster or anything. But I can imagine certain provisions where Korea being, uh, as Maria just talked about, access, market access in Japan, if this takes several more years where, where Korean business is disadvantaged or, for, or international business chooses not to locate in Korea because it's not part of the TPP, even though Korea is ready, the other partners trying to join at the same time are not ready, that actually could be a harm. So we talk about cost of not joining the TPP, a delay potentially could be harmful for Korea. Well, I do have, before we move on from the TPP, one last question. You know, we started off talking about Chorus, and we talked about the idea that Chorus, you know, is sort of the baseline for this. And I'd be interested in, you know, we'll start with Ted, but anyone else's thoughts, please feel free to chime in. You know, what are there any lessons from the course FTA that we should be applying to TPP, either in terms of the way the implementation has gone or things that are within the agreement? I, I do think, you know, again, talking more from a U.S. perspective here and what's in, in the U.S. interest, I, I do think the most important, and this is not just true for course, but I think it's true for, for all of the trade agreements we've negotiated. I think enforcement and implementation are crucially important. I think one of the reasons that you have so much opposition to the TPP. Some of it I agree with Derek. Some of it I, I, I think is just sectors that don't want competition. But I think there are many other cases where the, where the belief is we didn't really enforce the rules of our past agreements. And I think that's particularly a concern with Asia. There's a, a perspective in the United States that Japan, China, Korea, and others are quite clever at using regulatory tools to undermine the purported benefits of the agreements. And I think the United States has had trouble responding quickly and effectively to those. And you're already seeing a variety of little things crop up in the Korea context, regulatory concerns in the auto sector and others. And so I think it's really crucially important that we don't see these agreements as the end of something. They are really the beginning of something, which is the need to ensure that the rules are adhered to and, and the benefits of the agreements come through fully to all the partners involved. So again, that's not just a chorus lesson. I'd say it's a broader lesson, but it's certainly uh, there very much in the chorus context. I couldn't agree more. I think one of the things that's been clear in chorus is that we've negotiated a text and there are certain passages that are ambiguous because you have to get an agreement on the text. And, and I think that then lends itself to these implementation challenges in some, in some senses. But I think you have to have the right attitude about implementing it fully and faithfully in line with what has been negotiated. And you have to understand the underlying spirit of the agreement too, which is to open markets and eliminate trade barriers. You alluded to the, the problems in the auto sector. We've, there are commitments to reduce tariffs in the auto, uh, market in Korea, commitments to reduce the tariffs here, but we see continually things crop up with regard to efficiency standards and the like that have posed problems. And so it's taken negotiators or, or the people charged with implementing this a lot of time and effort in order to make sure that this stuff gets done in the, in the way that it was intended to. So that's an important 
lesson going forward. I think we have to be mindful of that, and we have to be really careful, not only in negotiating things. The other thing I would say is that it's important in these new rules areas for us, you know, we're, we've got this pretty highly evolved economy. We get things like digital trade rules and so forth. When you're working with countries, in some in the TPP that are at the lower end of the development spectrum, you really have to take the time and you have to figure out ways to explain why it's in their interest to do it in a way that moves to the highest standard rather than, than trying to um, strike compromises that then get, get problematic in the implementation stage. Well, I want to now shift over and bring China into the discussion, if you will. Korea, Derek, has FTAs now with the United States, the European Union, and China. How would you evaluate the Korea-China FTA in terms of how it compares with Chorus in the EU FTA? Okay, I did not read the Korea-EU FTA because I spent yesterday reading the entire Korea-China FTA. <laughs> It's 1,152 pages, if you want to know, on a PDF. Um, I did skip most of the tariff schedule, so that saved me a few hundred pages. But I read all the rules of origin, and that was really long. Uh, I don't know. Probably everyone's heard this joke already, but I'll, I'll use it anyway. We need a, a snappy slogan for China, Korea, like chorus. So I decided to do China ROK, or CROC for short. Um, <laughs> no, no hidden meaning intended. Um, if you look at, uh, at Chorus versus uh, Croc, um, it's obvious that the China-Korea agreement is just intended to skip over things that are hard. Uh, it's not to say that it doesn't do anything. It does do some things. There are, I'll give you a concrete example is China and Korea are more positively oriented toward trade facilitation steps than India is. And so what was difficult for the WTO to agree on, even though it seemed really easy, because India didn't want to agree on it, the language in the China-Korea agreement is much more positive, and, and you know, we just got the agreement, but it, that should uh, make the trade facilitation process much easier between China and Korea than it would at the, at the WTO level unless we get past this Indian objection. Um, so there are interesting things that go on in there, and, and let me also say, you're dealing in China with a country with no rule of law established. So when you're asking for some sort of enforcement process, there's not a lot of enforcement mechanism in the, in the, in the CROC agreement. And I, I just, I don't, you know, I, it's very glaring, but it's also, it's phytosanitary um, in, in technical barriers to trade. And what, there was another major one that I wrote down here. Um, there's no dispute settlement in either of those. Um, competition rules are almost non-existent. It's because you're just not going to get Chinese state-owned enterprises to be bound by this. And so what Korea did is just say, look, you know, let's not waste our time putting that down on paper because nothing's going to happen. That wasn't the case in the chorus agreement. There were explicit compromises made, but it wasn't just I give up, the rule of law doesn't apply. Um, you know, government procurement isn't in the China-Korea agreement because you know, Chinese aren't going to do that until they're ready and they're not going to do it with Korea. So, I mean, it's ex sort of what you would expect. Um, Korea doesn't have the leverage, Maria sort of mentioned this earlier, Korea doesn't have the leverage to open up the Chinese market. It's just not going to be able to do that. So it's going to make an agreement that's feasible. The U.S.-Korea agreement, of course, is just, has, it, that wasn't a concern. We weren't trying to, trying to open up a giant market. The U.S. is already open. So we, it, you know, it's just beyond uh, in the list of issues that were involved and how agriculture was treated and so on. Very controversial in Korea. Korea-China agreement's not going to be controversial in Korea because it's not doing anything in agriculture that's controversial. So those are the two differences. And again, I don't mean to say it's a total waste of time because there are some issues on which China and Korea agree that they can make advances beyond WTO uh, level uh, positions. But on all the things that you would think were hard, safeguards, et cetera, it's just a punt. And the U.S.-Korea agreement is not perfect, but they tried to take on harder issues and they made some progress on them. Well, I have a, another name suggestion, which the Koreans might prefer, which is the ROK China FTA, which would then just simply be ROC FTA. So you know, maybe <laughs> Korea will prefer that one. I like mine uh, better. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so I guess then my follow-up question to you would be is, you know, when Korea and China announced this FTA, um, you know, last fall, the narrative at the time was that, you know, China is increasing its influence in the region and that this is a loss for the U.S., and, you know, I'll read you the headline in the Wall Street Journal. South Korea, China uh, agree on outline of free trade deal, deal seen as potential challenge to U.S. economic influence. Um, and there were various quotes, you know, that they put in, some perhaps more silly than others in that. 
But so, I mean, does this FTA, you know, shift or signal a shift towards China, the region? And if not, what is the significance of the agreement itself? The United States has this thing of thinking that everything that happens shows, shows increasing Chinese influence in the region. So what happened here is we had a hiccup, obviously, with, with Chorus, which is it, it you know, took a long time to go from being agreed upon to being passed in the US. But nonetheless, we had a strong agreement passed between Korea and the United States. And then we had a considerably weaker agreement passed between China and Korea. Now, how does that show declining US influence? The US was first with a better agreement. China trailed along, which was you know, exactly by Korean design. They weren't going to sign an agreement with the Chinese until they were, had an agreement with the US because they wanted to sign an agreement with the US first because the US is more important. So I mean, this is just silly. Uh, you know, what should we do now? What should the US do to match China's move? Should we sign a weaker agreement with Korea? You know, that's what China did. So maybe we should sign a weaker agreement with Korea after China did and then say, we, you know, we've now won up China with a weak, late agreement. Um, I, I would say the same thing with RCEP. Uh, RCEP is not going to be real. Um, there, are, I, I have a lot of snide comments to make about that, but it would take us off topic. Uh, the, the, if the U.S. gets TPP done and it's a real agreement, TPP will completely outweigh RCEP in every respect. Now, if we fail, then there's an opening for, hey, the only negotiations that are getting anywhere, even if they're very uh, low ambition, is, is, is a China-led negotiation or China-proposed negotiation. But what's not going to be true is if we finish TPP and it's really good and an RCEP comes along later, that means US influence is declining. That's silly. And the same logic applies to Chorus and the China-Korea FTA. So what we maybe need is a therapy session then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Maria. Mm -hmm. A lot of this inf impacts Japan as well. And so, you know, looking at this from the perspective of Japan, you know, are there any challenges and opportunities offered by the Korea-China FTA? And does it spur any impetus for the trilateral agreement between the three of them? Well, I mean, to some extent, you know, Japan has always wanted the trilateral to move faster than the bilateral. So to the extent that the bilateral China-South Korea reached uh, agreement earlier, it, it puts pressure on Japan. But, um, and you know what, there's no prospect of fast movement on the trilateral. They have met now, I think, seven times. They cannot agree on the basics of the negotiation. There's no time limit for completion. So the idea that you could have a countervailing trilateral FTA that provides Japan that kind of access into the China-South Korea uh, uh, zone is not any time in the horizon. We cannot see it uh, coming. But um, I think this very much is in agreement with what Derek was saying. Um, I don't anticipate major pressure from the bilateral China-South Korea FTA on Japan because there are two basic mitigating factors. First confession, I did not spend all my day yesterday reading the <laughs> entire agreement. I just went with some summary uh, uh, <laughs> figures and uh, look, for example, at the tariff um, elimination targets. They're actually not revolutionary at all, and they're incre incredibly incremental. So I think in the first 10 years, I think that the tariff elimination is going to be something like 79%, 86%, and then 20 years down the road, it's going to reach a more respectable, but certainly not eye-opening, 91% or 92%. So we're talking about, and as Derek was saying, very, very guarded liberalization process is going to be slow, that's going to set aside the sensitive sectors. Had China and South Korea negotiated more a faster, broader elimination of barriers in their um, uh, economic transactions, then Japan might be more hard pressed. But that did not happen. And second, you know, we now have this 20-year timeline for that 90% uh, um, tariff elimination, and that gives plenty of time, obviously, for the TPP to come into force. And I think that if it does that's going to give Japan a tremendous leverage in dealing with China and South Korea. It's going to give a shot in the arm to the trilateral CJK, something that has not happened before. We have seen how uh, responsive China is to uh, Japan's membership in the TPP. When Japan came into the TPP, actually, China in major ways recalibrated straight strategy. It accelerated the feasibility study of the trilateral FTA by a year and actually agreed to the uh, Japanese proposal of thinking about a 16-nation membership group for the, uh, what is today the RCEP. So I would anticipate that both China and South Korea would be more eager to negotiate the trilateral once uh, the TPP is in place. OK, well, maybe since we're getting close to uh, you know, the end of the program, I have 
something sort of spurred by Derek's comments as well and something Maria said, and maybe we'll just start with Derek, and if anybody has comments, they can go through and add. You know, we've talked about the course FTA today. We've talked about, you know, now just the Korea-China agreement briefly. We've talked about TPP. Uh, you know, Maria, you and Derek have both mentioned uh, RCEP. You know, what do these agreements, if anything, tell us more broadly about, you know, the future of trade in East Asia? You know, and for that matter, what all this means then for the United States? Okay, that's a really big question, and we <laughs> want, you want a very short answer so we can take hopefully more specific questions from the audience. That's the uh, goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do think, I mean, I, this, it's a dismal science. I always go to the negative, which is we have one really powerful trade initiative on the table now. It's not the China-Korea trade agreement as we just discussed. Um, it's certainly not RCEP. It's just TPP. Uh, what I would say about this is we need to recognize we have too many eggs in this basket. And the U.S. needs to have different options, either bilateral within Asia or some sort of fallback multilateral option. Because um, I don't know where we would go. If TPP passes, it's an easy story to tell. We have a second round of membership. RCEP becomes a higher standard agreement because everyone's under pressure from TPP along the same lines as, as CJK discussions Maria was just talking about. That's easy to tell. We have a, the trade uh, bicycle is moving forward, and the other bikers kind of fall in line, and we move it. And it's not, the speed is unclear, and the details are unclear, but we're all moving forward. No TPP, and I don't know what we get. And so the way I'd answer your question was, you know, because it's so broad, is the, the U.S. needs to think strategically about what happens if TPP doesn't work. Because, um, you know, we didn't have, TPP was, came out of the failure of the WTO Doha round. And we, you know, it was kind of lucky that it did. The P4 was out there for us. If TPP fails, I don't see what's out there for us right now. So that's the big challenge for the United States. Um, if I can just add two cents. Um, I mean, the way I see things moving is that mm -hmm. we have effectively now transitioned to a system of decentralized competition. And by this, I mean that the stagnation of the negotiation process in the WTO means that countries have resorted to the trade agreements. They started small, they started very cautiously, and now we're in the era of the mega trade agreements. And this means that if you're not at the table, if you're not negotiating, if by default you put yourself in timeout, then others get to shape the rules. And I think that's the meaning of the Obama phrase behind this, but I think it has been played to, uh, too much. And actually, it has sort of obscured within my, what in my mind is actually the true value of the TPP, something that Ted was alluding to, and that is that it's an inclusive project. So for me, it's always been about the, the biggest premium in the TPP has been how you create an incentive structure whereby China can or will be willing to play by these rules. It might be a tall order. It's not going to happen next week. But the idea is that you try to move in that direction. And therefore, it is about having an open uh, structure. It's about having a docking mechanism. And it's about trying to increase other uh, uh, mega trade agreements level of ambition. The problem, I think, for uh, the United States, and this now uh, goes back to uh, Derek's point, is that I cannot think of a policy tool that is, you know, you can think big, you can think about statecraft, you can think about architecture, you can think about weaving uh, so many economies, the cutting edge rules on trade and investment, and it all boils down at the end of the day in this country to local politics. And that's, I think, the, the, the critical weakness, potential weakness of the United States that we may not come through, and that would, what that would mean for our uh, credibility. And my last word on this, so that we have time, I also think it's important we get perhaps to fix it on what China is doing, and the AIB has shifted the discussion on the TPP. But in trade diplomacy, I am a firm opinion that China is not a revisionist power. China does not have an alternative a view on trade rules to put forward. The big uh, uh, item that he announced in the APEC meeting when he was chairing last fall was the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, which by definition endorses what is a central security concern for the United States. We're talking about Asia Pacific integration. It was a concept launched by the United States. We should welcome China's initiative to endorse it. I, I was just going to say it was quite striking. Until the responses to this question, nobody on the panel even uttered the phrase WTO. We didn't even mention the WTO at all, which was, of course, the engine of global trade liberalization for, for many years in the old GATT system. I, I think one of the real challenges going forward is to figure out whether there's any way we can put all these eggs back into a single basket. There's talk about somehow integrating different trade agreements back into the multilateral system. I don't think anybody really has a good sense of what that means. Um, I do think that's important because I think 
the creation of the dispute settlement system in the WTO, I, you know, I work for the Council on Foreign Relations. It was, it was really um, a, a, an absolutely critical moment in the development of international governance. There, there's no other set of organizations uh, in the economic space or other that has created that, that kind of binding system for resolving rules disputes. And it was a tremendously important advance. And I worry that the longer the WTO negotiating process languishes, the less relevant those rules become for the settlement of disputes. So I, I do think the longer term challenge, and I, and I don't know exactly what longer term means here, is to somehow get back to the WTO. But I don't think anybody's really figured out how to do that. Yeah, Jim. Uh, I'll let it go to Q&A. Okay. All right, we'll open up to Q&A now. Uh, if you could please give your name and affiliation. The gentleman right there. Um, again, at, at Dana Marshall with Transnational Strategy Group. A couple of quick observations and maybe some comments on those. I don't, uh, for Derek, I don't want to overinterpret what Derek was saying. My earlier question was the issue of to what extent does um, the TPP advance U.S. foreign policy interests. I thought, Derek, you were making, again, I don't want to overinterpret your words, but it seemed to me what you were saying is that you were sort of undermining that argument by saying there's really no, <laughs> really no foreign policy argument for TP because if it, you know if it's not the US it's not going to be China so why are we worried about China if they're not sort of doing anything so that's sort of observation number one the second observation again for comments by the panel is um, the question of uh, of the negotiation of TPP we've discussed Korea coming in a lot easier than a China coming in but we all know that once there is a fixed text on TPP to dock into, it's going to be devilishly hard once China starts to knock on that door. And who knows when that will be, whether it will be, and what arguments there, there will be to bring them in or not bring them in. But it's likely they're going to knock on that door. The question, the sort of observation is, are the negotiators negotiating the current TPP understanding that we're going to have a very unusual country uh, that is not a market-based country, whether it is an ally of the West, I don't know. It's another question. And certainly of the largest uh, economy that would come in outside of the United States. Uh, is that negotiation being conducted with them in mind, though they're not sitting at the table? I, I have a comment on both, um, include the second one. I wrote a, a short piece a couple weeks ago about the state-owned enterprise chapter, which is the one I know most about in TPP, warning, um, and it was <laughs> deliberately shot at certain negotiators that you can't give the Singaporeans what they want on Temasek, or you can't, or you know, you're you're really disrupting any future negotiation with China, um, and. I just think that's absolutely true. The Congress has put markers down on SOEs. The what the Singaporeans want, as I understand on Temasek, is completely outrageous and would be uh, make it extremely difficult to talk to the Chinese. So they can't negotiate with all the countries not at the table, including China, Korea, and whoever else. But there are certain bounds on what can be allowed at TPP if you're looking into the future. It's an incredibly difficult task. I got some very nasty emails back about, like, how would you like to do it, buddy? I'm like, yeah, OK. Um, that's, that's fair. But that's one thing we're going to be evaluating TPP for when we see the text. We're absolutely going to be looking down the road and seeing, OK, there's a docking mechanism. Do we want anyone to dock? Um, you know, so, so that's my answer to that. My response to your first question is, I am not a foreign policy person. I don't, you know, to me, we get a bad TPP that doesn't advance liberalization. And someone says we need it for our diplomacy in East Asia. I'm going to tell them to get lost. We cannot have a bad trade agreement on commercial grounds. Can't do it. And that commercial grounds to me is not what business says, because business has a very short-term perspective on these agreements a lot. Commercial grounds are it advances what are the trade for the guiding trade principles for the US, which is more competition, um, less government intervention across the board. So you know that's how I'm going to evaluate it. And every time someone comes up with a foreign policy argument, I love the foreign policy arguments. We have a good agreement. We have a bad agreement, I hate them. Because now they're going to be used to justify approving a bad agreement, and a bad TPP has to be rejected. 
just quickly, just quickly on the foreign policy piece, and you see this often in the dynamics around trade agreements. Um, I think the TPP, in and of itself, in a in in a sort of neutral world, probably is not that important for U.S. foreign policy in Asia. I think there are lots of other things we could do in the region. The problem we have now is the agreement is almost completed, and if the Congress turns it down, that sends a signal to the whole region. It's a kind of rejection by the U.S. Congress of closer relations with some of our key allies in Asia. So what I really worry about is the foreign policy impact of that sort of no. It's not because I believe the TPP is so crucial to advancing U.S. diplomatic interests in Asia. I think there are a lot of other ways to go about that. But I do think a rejection would have very significant negative impacts in the region. That's my concern. Ted, if there is a rejection of the agreement, I mean, again, uh, you know, I'm not a, I, like all of us, we follow this closely, I'm not a cleared advisor, I've not seen the text, uh, but um, if there is a rejection of the text, I mean, why would it necessarily be the case that it's the U.S. fault that it was rejected? Would it not be the fault equally, at least theoretically, that our negotiating partners did not produce a satisfactory enough agreement? In other words, why do we take the position, Ted, uh, that it is our fault. And the other thing, too, is the fact that we have an enormous trade relationship with many of these countries, or to assuage them, uh, plus the security guarantees. Uh, I mean, I wonder how crushing, how much we would break their heart. <laughs> I agree with Derek. It has to, uh, to me, an economic agreement has to be an economic agreement. There are ancillary things, but I, I, I really wonder, and I'm a former State Department person, so I'm, a for, you know, I, I'm sensitive to those arguments, but... I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. Well, I mean, I think we, we inevitably get into a lot of counterfactuals here. So let's say the Congress rejected trade promotion authority, and it was the view of the administration that there were moves that could be made uh, that would make the Congress happy, and that that involved talking to some of the TPP partners and saying, for instance, could we live with currency language? Could we live with the renegotiation of the investor provisions that Derek talked about? So I think it's quite possible that that wouldn't be the end of the road, that there would be other discussions. But I do think, you know, at the end of the day, if the negotiating process dies because Congress won't give the administration trade negotiating authority, I think the U.S. is going to be blamed for that. And I think it will be seen in the region as, as, as a negative in terms of relations with the U.S. So, so I, I do think the U.S. role here is very key. Yeah. Congressman Azul. I, um, I think one of the big problems with with uh, TPP moving through the House is the issue of Vietnam. It's unspoken, but many members look upon the United States as entered into a free trade agreement with a country such as Vietnam, which is still uh, an avowedly communist country, is very difficult. They're finding it very hard to see how Vietnam fits into that whole package. But notwithstanding that, if Congress does not approve of TPP, then the U.S. will be looked upon not as a first-rated uh, trade partner in the world, but second-rated a country they can't agree with in itself to take a leadership position. That's what's at stake. It's, it's, the, it's the leadership position of, of the U.S. The third thing I wanted to add that goes back to Chorus FTA, and that is the, um, the unwritten beneficiaries of course, FTA. What I have seen happening is items that are not even covered by Chorus FTA, people are looking at in terms of a brand new relationship between the U.S. and Korea. Korea has a 5% market share of world production of machine tools. Uh, not 5%, they're number five in world production. The United States is number seven. If you look at it in terms of what, what, what is Korea doing? And I see manufacturers that are taking a look at Korean machine tools. They didn't look at them before. And of course, FTA really doesn't have that much to do with it. But they see Korea in a new light, in a, in a higher perspective than they've looked at before. I think this is, to me, it's extraordinary that you can have these beneficiaries that are not even listed within the agreement itself. And lastly is the overall relationship between the U.S. and Korea is enhanced, obviously, by the FTA itself, but, but 
just as importantly, people look upon a free trade agreement as bringing people closer together. It's, it's a, uh, I don't want to say a peaceful gesture, because we're obviously we're a very close ally with Korea, but in terms of if you can come to terms on a free trade agreement, then you have some basis of, 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 talk, of talking to each other. The United States is looking upon Korea now as a very interesting country, but what a lot of people in the United States don't realize is the wealth that has been produced, for example, by Korea foreign direct investment that's not even related to the to the uh, 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 to Chorus FTA. If you go to places in Alabama um, and Georgia that are the beneficiaries of these giant Kia and Hyundai plants, the wealth can't even be estimated as a result of the result of these automobiles. So people look favorably upon the Kia, the Hyundai, they look favorably upon other things that are manufactured in Korea. That helps, in my mind, both countries. And that's why FTA, I don't think it's too early to say that it's, that it's beneficial. I think we can take a look at it now and say it is beneficial. We just have to work on the areas that need improvement to make it even more beneficial to both countries. Yeah. I, I, just one thing occurred to me listening to uh, both Ted and the Congressman. I, I think there's a different impact on U.S. leadership if TPA is rejected than TPP is rejected. TPA being rejected looks like the U.S. can't even provide authority to negotiate a trade agreement. I mean, it's a little complicated by the fact that TPA is coming up so late. But we already have people saying the president and the Congress can't get along, Republicans, Democrats can't get along. If you have an alliance between congressional Republicans and the president, where the congressional Republicans are the majority, and we have a Democratic president, and that still can't get TPA, informed observers of the U.S. political scene are like, what political consolation is going to work here? On the other hand, if TPA passes and TPP doesn't, Presumably, TPP fails because of very specific economic issues. And that may be, back to your point, Dana, because we just don't like the terms of TPP. I can imagine a TPP I don't like. It may be because China's looming in the background. It may be because the Japanese can't make their own political decisions. So I think TPA is a very important hurdle for U.S. leadership. And TPP, it remains to be seen because we have to see the text, of course, but we also have to see why it might fail. Okay, Stanley in the very back. Stanley Cobra, on that last point, I just have to clarify something. It was the Republicans in the Senate who supported the president on the TPA. Yeah. Only one Democratic senator right. voted with the president in that vote that went down. That's about as bipartisan as you get. Well, it's actually, totally, yeah. it, it depends on what you mean by bipartisan. My point was, we've already we've had. Con, you know, president versus Congress, we've had Democratic versus Republican. If we now can't get something done, even when congressional Republicans agree with the Democratic president, it really looks dysfunctional to the but, rest but of the world. But it was the president's own party, which I find oh, very yeah, strange. Yeah. That's, that, huh. But just from the very world odd. standpoint, that's, that's just another sign of U.S. dysfunction, if it were to occur. Um, but I do have a question here. I'm wondering if this isn't... Um, sort of like Nero fiddling while Rome burns. As I look around the global economy... What I am seeing is a collapse in demand in all countries, pretty much. As a result of that, we have sequestration. Where will the demand come from? Government spending has got to go down. Look at the news from Europe today about Greece. Government spending has to go down. Private spending will go down. Investment spending, I mean, where will that come from if people don't see markets for the goods? Plus, you have the aging crisis. To my mind, that is the major problem now confronting the global economy. Where will the demand come from? And I go to all these meetings on TPP and TTIP. Will they help address that problem of increasing global demand? Well, I'll take a shot at this. Uh, the answer is probably not. Um, you know, the direct economic benefits of the U.S. for TPP, for example, even in, in, in the best possible terms, I can imagine, just aren't going to be that large. We already have FDAs with six of these countries. Um, you know, we have very you know, sizable trade with Canada and Mexico that are number one and three trading partners. Yeah, U.S. agricultural exports to Japan are going to increase, and it'll increase Japanese demand because it'll save the Japanese money. But I don't think that's going to transform the world. When you're talking about 
at the level you're talking about, Stanley, you need domestic economic reforms. Um, and what TPP is good for is, in, in a small way, is having countries engage in push countries to engage in domestic economic reforms. But TPP doesn't go, or I doubt TTIP will, but we don't know it yet, doesn't go to the heart of things. You know, TPP isn't going to fix the US entitlement problem. That's a, that's a, that's a real change in the direction of the American economy. If it did, Elizabeth Warren would be really unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, uh, it, it's not, uh, TPP might, might help Japan do things, but Japan has very fundamental problems which are not going to be addressed by TPP. Uh, and as the smaller economies which have less contribution to the world, then trade agreements matter more, but they don't affect global demand as much. So no, um, this is not supposed to be a solution to the global demand problem. I don't want to get into a long discussion of that. But I, I will say that you know, for certain things, it's going to help a little bit. Japanese consumers should be able to save money by getting in more imported products more easily. You know, Vietnam has had serious inflation problems, which would be checked by greater competition in their economy. Are they going to turn the world economy around with, with stronger demand in those countries? No. It's just a little bit of help. All right, well, we, we've had a very interesting discussion today, one that I think is very helpful and insightful and informative. Um, if you'll join me then in thanking Dr. Lee and then our panelists for a very great discussion. Thank you very much.